All right, I guess we'll get started now. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this beautiful day and have time to get outside once we um, end this webinar today. Um, so my name is Lauren and I'm the Education and Outreach Assistant at the Environmental Cooperative at Vassar. And we also have here with us today, Director Jen Rubo and uh, Lucy Culpa, who is a Student Conservation Association member and another Education and Outreach Assistant. So I just wanna say a few housekeeping things before we get started. If you could please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. We're gonna have a few points where we'll have participation and we really hope that uh, then you raise your hand and unmute and talk to us and throw answers and questions in the chat. Um, but until those times, just please keep yourself muted so we can stay focused on the presentation. And then we will have a few question periods. So if you're thinking of questions while we're presenting, then you can throw them in the chat or keep them in your head and we'll address them during our question times. So today's gonna look like um, kind of a example of what one of our like, virtual science meets would be like for kids. We're gonna go through a tour of the Exploring Science Padlet and talk a little bit about what a Padlet is, how to use it, and then go through some science activities that would happen if you signed up for a virtual science meet with us, which we hope you all do once uh, you see our programming today. Uh, so right now we're gonna get started with Jen Rubo, who's going to go over a little introduction of the Environmental Cooperative and Ecological Preserve at Vassar. All right, great. Thank you so much, um, Lauren, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, I just wanted to start um, first with a land acknowledgement um, and just acknowledging the original stewards and educators of um, the land that we live on now. Um, and this is specific to Vassar College, but um, the lands that are now Vassar College were once home to the Delaware Nation and the Delaware Lenape tribe, which are both now located in Oklahoma and um, the, also the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohegan Indians, which have um, moved to Wisconsin. Um, both of those were um, forcibly moved um, and relocated. Um, many sources reference the Wappinger Indians as the indigenous peoples of our campus, but they were actually a confederacy um, of native peoples who organized at one time in response to the Euro-American incursions in the area. And they actually no longer exist as an organized group um, compared to the other tribes that I mentioned, which actually do still exist. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so like Lauren said, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction to the Environmental Cooperative and the Vassar Farm and Ecological Preserve. Um, so, we, we are located at, on Vassar College campus. We're actually this whole Southern rectangle of the, of the college. Um, many people know us as the Vassar Farm or the Vassar Farm and Ecological Preserve. Um, but um, actually most of this is designated as an ecological preserve, pretty much from this area sub, south is an ecological preserve. And then this northern part of it is, is kind of a multi-use area, which I'll talk a little bit about in a, in a second. Um, the main campus is this whole upper area. And in total, the whole space is about a thousand acres with the ecological preserve being about 420 acres of that. The environmental cooperative is located right where this blue flag is. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the cooperative's mission is, is basically to inspire engagement, um, support current efforts and develop new opportunities, all focused on conservation, education, outreach and research. Slide, next slide. Um, and we do that in, in several ways. Um, we're really kind of the outward facing portion of the ecological preserve, so we, develop ways for Vassar students to get off campus and engage in conservation efforts that are happening locally. We also organize community events um, for the community and Vassar students to participate in. Um, we have space in a, um, we're located in a renovated um, cow barn on the ecological preserve and that space is available for groups to use. Um, and, um, in the past, pre-COVID, we um, often had workshops and um, 
you know, film screenings, all kinds of stuff happening in that space. And then we also have an edu have education programs, which is what the focus of tonight is. Um, one of them being our exploring science program where we do structured um, field trips and other education programs for children um, and college students as well. Next slide, please. So the Vassar um, Ecological Preserve, it, sometimes people get it a little confused because the Environmental Cooperative is located on the Ecological Preserve and the Ecological Preserve also has its own mission statement, but the Ecological Preserve is more focused on um, education and research for the Vassar College community, mostly its students, of course. Um, where we overlap is in the activities that the Environmental Cooperative helps to um, facilitate and implement on the ecological preserve. So that's um, where our field trip based programs come in. Next slide, please. Um, the preserve has a number of different things going on in it. Like I said, it's a pretty multi use area. We have community gardens that are managed by um, Vassar College. We have the Poughkeepsie Farm Project, with me, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, the PFP is its own nonprofit that leases land from Vassar College and has um, not only its own education program, but also um, community supported agriculture. So you can actually join um, as a member of the Poughkeepsie Farm Project and get produce on a weekly basis during the summer. Um, rugby and cross country are the Vassar's rugby and cross country teams both use the preserve for, um, for their games and meets. Um, also, other local cross country teams use the ecological preserve. Um, there's storage facilities on the, on the ecological preserve, and then there's also the environmental cooperative. Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned before, it's about 420 acres. There are seven miles of trails that are um, open to the public in normal times. So right now, because of COVID, um, Vassar College is pretty much closed to the public and also Vassar students are not allowed off campus. So a lot of what I'm talking about right now is, um, is pre-COVID and I'm sure um, there will be some form of it happening again once um, vaccines are more available. But um, but there are seven miles of trails on the preserve that we are hoping will open up again soon um, to the public. Um, there's a lot of academic resources that, um, that, that Vassar classes use on the preserve. And we've calculated that there's about 20,000 visitors per year that come out to the, um, to the preserve. It, it actually is a really important resource for the town and city of Poughkeepsie. Next slide. Um, but in addition to being this resource for recreation, it actually offers, the Ecological Preserve offers a lot, lot more benefits. Um, it, it sequesters carbon, so it's helping to mitigate climate change in the local area. Um, the Casper Kill, which is a tributary of the Hudson River, flows directly through the preserve, and the, the surrounding forested area of the Casper Kill of the preserve helps to cleanse the water um, in the stream and also. Um, allows the stream to flood without harming um, any structures around it because it is going through an undeveloped area. Um, and then there, it also provides habitat for a number of different species. We have bobcat, we have mink, we have beavers, um, white-tailed deer, a whole bunch of different um, animals, um, amphibians, um, birds um, that, live, that live on the ecological preserve within this like matrix of suburban and urban development. Um, we also have um, um, old fields. So the preserve was once farmed and um, used by Vassar College as farmland to support the college. And a lot of those fields are now um, maintained as meadows. So they provide um, really important habitat for pollinators. Um, we have over 250 wildflower species on the preserve. Um, we have rare plants, animals, and ecological communities. And of course, like I mentioned, it is um, a really great resource for um, maintaining public health and um, through, through providing an area for people to go running or walk their dogs or just kind of um, getting out into nature. Next slide. 
Um, so Exploring Science is a program that started in 1983. Um, and in the past, it's been, um, as I mentioned before, a field trip based program where students could um, mostly second and third graders. It provided an opportunity for second and third grade classes to get some hands-on science experience. And so um, they would come out to the preserve for a half day field trip. Um, and the field trips were led by trained faster students. So students that were interested in getting a degree in education or um, just wanted to volunteer and get some, get some experience working with kids would um, work the Ex Exploring Science program. Um, in 2019, we've shifted the program slightly to um, be, it was, it actually became under the, under the purview of the Environmental Cooperative and we were changing the structure of the program a little bit so that instead of being a one-time program where teachers could bring their students for a half day, we were trying to formulate it into more of a um, field trip program surrounded by pre and post programming where faster students would go into the classroom and teach a lesson before and after the field trip. Um, unfortunately, then COVID happened and all of that got canceled. And so um, out of that grew what we're gonna be presenting tonight, which is our online exploring science um, curriculum. And this is supported by the platform called Padlet, which I know some of you probably have had have some experience with, but if not, we're gonna walk you through it. Um, so, with that, I think at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Lucy, who's going to kind of walk through the program. Is there another slide after this one, Lauren? Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll hand it over to Lucy. She's going to share her screen and show you our Padlet, and, um, and then we'll have some time for questions right after that. Sweet. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited that I get to share with you our um, Spring Padlet, which we're super excited to launch. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right. So yeah, so um, yeah, for those of you who haven't used Padlet before, um, it's a really great like uh, way to interact with students. Um, super collaborative and like, I don't know, at least personally, it's been really great. Um, a great way for us to interact with students uh, because we have such limited interactions with them these days. Um, so the link to our Padlet is going to take you to this page right here that looks like this. Um, and as like with these five different boxes, um, this first one right here is just And we have that is not possible um, this spring. So we have focused our uh, virtual curriculum into these four categories. Um, and they're all organized in the same way as you are about to see. So for efficiency purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to uh, take you down one. Um, so let's check out the, the forest padlet. So yeah, as I said earlier, all of the habitats um, and all of our content is going to be organized the same way, regardless of what habitat you are checking out. So. We have this first column, let's learn about forests. We have the second one, videos and pics. Then there's activities. And then finally, we have test your knowledge. So this first one, let's learn about forests. Um, this just gives a really nice introduction, a nice overview of um, not only the forests that we have on the Vassar Ecological Preserve, um, but also provides any necessary information that might be needed to complete some of the activities or quizzes and assignments that we have later on in the Padlet that you are going to see. Um, 
And then, so this videos and pictures column, I'm sure you can kind of guess what is going on here. Um, but this is where we have um, a bunch of relevant pictures and videos. We have a read aloud. Um, that's like something that we've been doing on our Padlet that seems to be really popular is getting a lot of views um, by the students that we're working with um, is we'll post these read aloud videos of relevant stories. Um, and then pictures that are either taken on our preserve or maybe found online that we think are relevant, we are going to share here. Um, and this is also a space on our Padlet where we encourage students and teachers as well to share content with us. Um, and that kind of leads me to um, one of our favorite aspects about Padlet is how um, collaborative it is. Um, and that's uh, I don't know, at least like a big highlight of our fall Padlet was it just became completely decorated with posts from students and everyone was commenting on each other's posts. Um, and that was like a really great thing to see again because we have such limited interaction with students. Um, so we encourage all the commenting and all the content sharing that we can possibly get. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you all how to make a post to the Padlet. Posting a comment is super easy. You're just, there's this add comment at the bottom of every post, you click it, um, and then you can write whatever your comment is. Um, and then you press this arrow and the comment is going to upload automatically. Um, one thing I will say is that while you do not need a Padlet account to access our content um, to make a comment, uh, you do need a Padlet account um, to have like an official username. So if you don't have a Padlet account, your comment or whatever post is going to pop up as anonymous. So um, which is totally fine. We have just told students um, and, you know, teachers, if you want us to know who you are, please just comment like your name um, and then maybe add what class you're in or like what school you're from, that sort of thing. Um, and then so posting comments, you're just going to, you know, click that arrow and the comment is going to upload automatically. It's a little bit different for when you're uploading like actual media. So at the top of every column um, here on the Padlet, you see these uh, plus signs. So to make a post, let's say I have a video of um, my favorite tree that is in bloom and I want to share a picture of it on the forest Padlet. I'm going to click this plus sign right here add a title, um, I'll say tree blooming, um, <laughs> and then maybe write a description. And then um, depending on what sort of media it is, you can click these three dots in the corner here. And then there's a ton of options if you wanna take a picture directly on your uh, device. Um, however you have it saved, there is a lot of different ways to upload a lot of different um, content. The only thing that's a little bit different about the um, uploading a video or picture versus a comment is that your comment is going to pop up automatically. Um, the videos and pictures, however, those have to first be approved by me or Jen or somebody else on our team. Um, so if your students are freaking out like, oh my gosh, my picture didn't upload, um, you know, just let them know like we have to go in and approve it. They shouldn't freak out. They shouldn't try to upload it a million times. Um, but we do try to check our Padlet um, as frequently as we can. So there shouldn't be too much of a, a lag. Just have them check back like later that day or maybe the following day. Um, and yeah, so moving on, the next column that we have here is the activities column. Um, so this is where we've posted a ton of really fun activities that can be completed at home. Um, some of them are a little more educational. Some of them are a little more like arts and crafty. Um, Lauren just put together this really fun bird sing along. Um, so those are just fun to do at home. And this is another great space where we do want to encourage students to maybe upload pictures of their final product. Um, like for example, I think there's a couple collage making um, activities that we have. So um, whether you want to take a picture of your final product or um, if it's like a Google slide, for example, um, encourage students to upload those here. Um, I know, I don't know, these have been, students have been really enthusiastic about our activities and we've gotten a lot of good feedback. Um, so yeah, and then 
Moving on to the test your knowledge column. Um, this is where we have placed all of the assignments and quizzes um, that students are welcome to take just on their own time if they want to see what they've learned from the Padlet. Or also, um, we have made sure that all of these um, assignments and quizzes are suited for the Google Classroom. Uh, we use a couple different formats, a lot of like uh, Google Forms. Um, we use a lot of like Google Slide. Um, there's a, a little bit of Kahoot in here. Um, so if if you teachers are interested in using our uh, curriculum, some of our activities to like formally evaluate your students, please feel free to reach out to us and then we will find a way to get you um, those responses. Like for example, on a Google form, like we're gonna be notified when those are filled out. Um, but if you are interested in, um, in evaluating your students that way, um, yeah, please like reach out to us and then we're more than happy to give you those scores. Um, so I think that is mostly it for Padlet. Jen, I don't know if you think I'm either forgetting about something. I know that was a lot of information all at once. So if there are any um, questions on how to make a Padlet post, uh, maybe how to like implement it in your classroom, feel free to. Lucy, um, I'm wondering if you can maybe quickly show the fall, the winter Padlet where there's For some sure. activity on it. Yeah, I was actually thinking about that. So. Let's see if I go to my, um, okay, so I know, yeah, I think the beaver pond had a lot. So this is an example, like this running the same curriculum in the fall. Um, and so here is an example of what kind of like the, I don't know about like final product, but just like after students have um, you know, had their chance to check out the Padlet. As you can see that we have this read aloud of a, um, a, of a beaver story, um, like what happens to beavers in the winter. And there are all these like great comments um, from students. Um, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of just cool, but um, again, it's like great to see um, that they're like loving what they see. And um, also, yeah, we definitely try to encourage uh, not just getting all these um cool 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 um i'm trying to see if there was a post yeah jen do you want me to try to find one of the habitats with the i know i think maybe the stream had a i think that's fine if it wasn't like clear already um but yeah so we have organized our um, all of our material like by habitat and then also by season. Um, so part of one of the things that we're looking for when we are deciding if we're going to like approve or deny like a content post is we want it to be relevant to the habitat. So if like, you know, make sure if you have beaver content to put it in like the beaver pond, um, you know, and we don't want to see posts of like exotic animals like jaguars or sharks because unfortunately on the Vassar, preserve we do not have um, an ocean or a rainforest habitat as cool as that would be so um, yeah we really just want these um, you know we're trying to like emulate as best we can um, you know our exploring science in person so we want it want to make sure that the information pertains to um, the natural events that are happening on the preserve Yeah. Um, okay. So I think Lauren's having some issues with her her um, her Wi-Fi, but um, I'm gonna try and get you off of the so you're unpinned. Um, okay. Oh, there she is. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
my Wi-Fi keeps having issues today, so I hope this works, but bear with us just in case we have a few technical difficulties coming our way. I'm going to share my screen, but this is also now a time for questions. So if you have any questions about the Padlet, anything Lucy talked about, or any questions about the cooperative in general, um, feel free to raise your hand or throw your questions in the chat. I was just curious if, oh. I'm, I actually unmuted. I tried to put something in the chat, but it said that I need permission to, like it was, it's disabled. Oh. <laughs> I can just stay unmuted and ask my question. Sure, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so is this something that we can just log on to now and utilize this, or is this something the district hasn't bought into yet? I'm not really sure. Um, how that is. So um, we have a registration form that we would like you to fill out um, just so that we can track it. As far as your district is concerned, I mean, in the, the teachers we've, the teachers we've worked with in the past have, um, they've just logged in, you know, with, I don't think that, I don't, I don't know how your district works if you need permission from them to use it or not, but we just work, been working with directly with teachers. Okay. So. And where would we get, and the registration form, that's something that was in the original email, I think, right? That said registration form. Um, yeah, I believe so. But we can also send that again at the end. We'll be sending a follow up email that has that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so there's another question in the chat that is asking about suggestions for remote classroom classrooms on how to use it. So is this asking if you're teaching? Um, can you clarify that question? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Okay, so you're teaching fully remotely and um, the way we've done it the, with other teachers that have taught fully remote is, yeah, so the kids are at home. So teachers are, um, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can, um, we've had one teacher that has been assigning a habitat a week to their students. And um, so they have to, I guess, work through that habitat. And at the end of the week, um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what she does, but she, um, we did do a couple of Google Meets with them online using Google Meet, and we had, you know, we're able to see the whole class online. Um, and we're going to go through what a Google Meet might look like um, right after this. Um, other teachers have just been assigning them the entire Padlet at once and saying, I guess, just kind of as like um, enrichment, you know, like if you want to go ahead and use it at home on their own, they can go through and work through any of the activities they want. Um, we also had a, a class where we, we met with the students online, we assigned, we went through, actually we went through the lesson that we're gonna go through with you today, which is called, I Notice, I Wonder, it Reminds Me Of. We went through that with them in a meet, and then two days later, we had another meet with the classroom and they were able to share what they did at home. Um, online with, with the class and we kind of reviewed what we, what everybody did. So there's, it's really um, adaptable to however you wanna use it, I think. Does that help answer your question? Okay. Any other questions specific to the Padlet? We'll have time for more questions later also if something comes up, so. Okay. Okay, great. 
So um, Jen actually um, led us really nicely into our next topic, which is about the virtual science visits. And she mentioned a few points that we really want um, to uh, hammer home today. And especially the point that we're flexible, you know, we really want to be able to work with your timing for your science classes and uh, whatever um, online platform you're using. Uh, we really want to be adaptable and flexible to um, what you're doing right now with your school program. So normally our length for science visits, are it's about 25 to 50 minutes, but again, it can be adaptable based on what your science um, class is scheduled for at school. Um, and we'll work with you to be on uh, whatever online platform you use. So what do these visits usually look like? Um, we usually go over the Padlet a little bit, kind of like Lucy just showed us, and we show students how to use it. So we show them how to comment on it and how to use um, all the different activities, videos, and crafts on there. And then we do a show and tell, and we show cool objects that we have found on the Vassar Ecological Preserve. And we do this really to try to promote an interest in nature and in a more place-based way where students can relate to um, where they're living and go outside and maybe see some of these objects themselves. And then we practice with them some observation skills when we're doing the show and tell. And then lastly, we run some interactive science activities. And the one that we're doing today, and Jen also mentioned, is called I Notice, I Wonder, and It Reminds Me Of. And this is really focused on um, getting students to start thinking like scientists do and making cool observations and asking questions um, about a natural object. And this is the kind of activity that we would run if we were going to see your class more than once. So we would introduce the activity in one meet and then students would do the um, activity at home or at another time during the school day and then come back at another visit and we would talk about um, how the activity went. And then other times if we're only doing one science meet then we'll do um, some more a shorter game that's still really interactive and trying to get students um, engaged with us. And we're going to run an example today that is about bird songs and it that activity actually matches another activity on the Padlet. So um, students will also find that the activities we do together in the science meets will be very related to the activities that they're going to do on the Padlet. All right, so now we're gonna go through, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of to get a little feel of what a science visit would look like. Um, so if you could put on your best second and third grade or whatever grade um, you teach thinking cap and we're gonna get started. Uh, so this is the template for the activity. If you have it printed out, then that is awesome. If not, you could draw this really quickly. It's a pretty simple template or just write down your observations and questions on a piece of paper. And we really like this circle because um, making observations and asking questions isn't always linear. And then also this circle in the middle of the template is for drawing an object. And drawing an object really helps to get students thinking about the different qualities of an object and will help therefore to make observations and come up with questions. So first we wanna start thinking about what makes a good observer. So here are some people and characters that are good observers. And so I want you first to write three reasons why these people are good observers. And you can write these three reasons in the chat. Oh no, <laughs> she'll be back, I promise. Okay, can you see it all yeah. back? Okay, I hope this doesn't happen too many times. <laughs> um, so do we get some reasons in the chat? So they use their senses, they focus in on one sense at a time, so that's a good point. They search for answers.
Yeah, those are some great responses. They're motivated. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah, so really the point of this activity is to help students kind of think in a way that will help them to notice what they're observing more and to be excited about what they're observing. Um, so this lesson will hopefully give students uh, skills to become a better observer and therefore a better scientist. So what is an observation? An observation is something that we notice with our five senses. So our five senses are sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. And we're gonna be making observations using our three senses, um, but we're gonna use the prompts, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And so this is what brings me to our template here. And hopefully you have a natural object already with you. Uh, but if not, um, you'll have a couple minutes to draw your objects. So if you don't have one, then you can run and find one outside or run and even find a house plant. You just need any natural object. It can be a rock, a leaf, a stick. Um, and we're going to start by taking two minutes just to draw your object. So in that middle little circle in your template, I want you to draw the object that you have. And while you're drawing your object, pay attention to any patterns, textures, smells maybe, any lines that you see or how your object feels. And we'll come back in just a minute. All right, so don't worry if you haven't finished your drawing or if it's not a masterpiece, that's not what a drawing and uh, for observation is about. You can see, I don't even know if you can see that, but it's definitely not a great drawing of this flower on the screen here, but it did help me to notice that there are so many petals on this flower. And that was one of the things that I noticed about my uh, natural object was that um, this flower is yellow with many, many petals, and it would be even better if I counted all of those petals. That would be a great observation. Uh, so we're going to start working on our template with the prompt I notice. Um, again, once we talk about this template with students, they can kind of do it mismatched, but we're going to start with I notice. And 
So all you have to do is write I notice and then write um, something that you notice with your five sentences or five, with your five senses. So my example was I noticed this flower is yellow with many petals or I noticed this flower feels like paper. So now I want you to practice using your natural object and write down your observation. And Okay, so until she comes back, um, one of the things that I like to, um, you know, to really talk about with students at this point is that, you know, you're looking at specifics. And like Lauren said, if you can count something about your object or, you know, really identify colors, shapes, be get as specific as possible when you're talking about I notice. Go ahead, Lauren. Okay, thank you, Jen. And I'm so sorry about this. Um, so uh, now would be an awesome time if you could raise your hand. We'd love to hear some of your observations using I notice, or you could throw your observation in the chat. Hi, I just unmuted myself. Is it okay for me to share? Yeah. Okay. Great. So I found this leaf outside when I was bringing the kids to their bus. Um, I tried to find rocks yesterday, but my nephew kept taking them. Um, but I wrote, I noticed that the leaf is brown. It has many lines or veins. It has a stem. The edges are curled in. It feels dry or crunchy and it has three holes in it. Oh, awesome. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I loved especially that you looked at the lines and the veins and you counted all the holes in there and looked at all the different qualities of the leaf. I think it's and I think it's also important to remember that you're not giving opinions when you're noticing, right? So we're not going to say, you know, this leaf looks gross or, you know, it's really ugly. Right, because those are opinions and not um, observations necessarily. Yeah, that's a really important point. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next step. Oh, can someone give us one? I noticed that my stick is dry. I noticed that it's bumpy and rough. It has a, um, a line running up it. Yeah, that's great, thank you. All right, so the next prompt is, I wonder. And this one is coming up with a question based on our natural object. And as we ask questions, there's one really important point that we wanna make. Um, we really encourage students to ask questions that do not start with why. We would rather they ask questions that use how, when, um, if, or what instead of why, um, because these types of questions uh, can lead to answers that we can research or um, start looking into more in a science um, setting. Uh, so for instance, uh, I asked, I wonder when this flower bloomed. Uh, so that's something that we could actually research and figure out versus asking, I wonder why this flower bloomed. All right, so does anyone wanna be brave and share? Uh, something that they wonder about their natural object. I um, did, I did ask a why, but I changed it from a why to a what, but I originally said, why are there holes? And then I changed it to what made holes in the leaf. Um, mm -hmm. And as a second grader, what type of tree did it come from? But I know what kind of tree it came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, those are great questions. Maybe there's one more person want to share. Oh, good, we got one in the chat. All right, someone asked, how does the flower bloom? Another good question that we could definitely find the answer to. All right, awesome. So moving on to our next prompt is, it reminds me of, and I really like this one because it connects what uh, we already know 
to what we're observing. And so making these connections is something that scientists do all the time and is how we progress forward um, in the scientific world. Uh, so you could think about something that the object look like, looks like or maybe memories that this object makes you think of. Uh, so for instance, I had a few examples using my flower saying this flower reminds me of um, but you can go ahead and, and say what your natural object now reminds you of. Um, yeah, I think Jenna already said it, but if anyone wants to throw their responses in the chat. So Rebecca said it reminds her of rest, the leaf. Karen said it reminds her of hair. It reminds me of my hand because of the veins. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, awesome. Hey, great. Thank you so much for your participation and going through that activity with us. Um, there is one more activity with bird songs that I know you're really excited for. Um, so, but before we move into that, is there any questions about the, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of the activity. All right, I don't think so, but if anything comes to mind, we're going to have another time for questions. After. I just want to um, add something. Um, when we did this, when we do this as a Google Meet with your class, we um, we actually will demonstrate it for them, go through it once with them and demonstrate it, and then they take the activity and do it on their own at home or wherever. Um, and then the next meet, when we meet with them again, we go through and, and they share what they did. So we're not actually sharing along the way. Um, we don't actually do the activity together when we do it as a Google Meet. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. I'm just gonna pull up my next activity and then we'll get started. All right, so this one is about bird songs. And this one, I really need everyone's participation because this is all about participation um, and maybe even a little bit of kind of singing. Uh, you don't really have to sing, but just say some words because <laughs> um, we are talking about songs. Um, but you can also throw um, your answers in the chat, uh, which I'll explain in a second. So a little background information before we get started there are a few vocabulary words that we have to learn before we begin this activity. And the first one is a mnemonic. And a mnemonic is something that we use to help us remember something. And in this case, we're using it to help us remember what something sounds like. So for example, a mnemonic could be pitter patter. And pitter patter is the mnemonic for what rain sounds like, or for flip-flops, they make a flip-flop sound. So saying flip-flop, flip-flop, that's the mnemonic for flip-flops. And so we're gonna use these mnemonics to learn about and remember what bird songs sound like. We're gonna be making our own. So a common mnemonic you may know for a duck is quack. And then another vocabulary term that seems really big, but is actually really, um, relatively simple but really important is biodiversity. And biodiversity means the variety of life. And it means that it's really important for there to be many types of plants and animals all around the world. So for example, there are many different kinds of birds and we're gonna hear a few different bird sounds today and we hear so many all the time and they're not always the same. They're not all tweet and they're not all chirp and they're all different shapes, sizes, colors, 
uh, and sounds. So for this game, we're going to be creating our own mnemonics for bird sounds. And this will help us to remember what these birds sound like. So we're going to be creating our own words to describe what we're hearing. So we're going to listen to what a bird song sounds like. And then we'll probably listen to it again, maybe even again. And then write in the chat the words that you hear for that sound, the mnemonic, or raise your hand and for us to call on you. And we'd love to hear what you think it sounds like. Um, and I'm going to go through one example now. So all of this makes sense uh, before we get started. All right, so the first call we're going to listen to is the barred owl. Isn't he really cute? <laughs> All right, so we're going to listen to it one more time. And then I'll share with you the sound that I've been thinking of. All right, so after listening to that a few times, I was thinking about it and I was kind of thinking that it sounds like, who wears my shoes? Who wears my shoes? And if I said that to myself, it might help me remember that that's a barred owl the next time that I'm out in the woods. So let's see what the experts say. All right, so they don't say that silence. They say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So let's listen to that. <laughs> See if you can hear it. Is that cool? Does everyone hear it? Thumbs up if you could hear that. Yeah, awesome. All right, so now it's your turn. We're going to listen to a few more bird calls or songs, and I want you to think of the words you would use to describe that sound. All right, so this one is the Eastern Tauhi. And I want you to think about the words you'd use to describe the song, and then either raise your hand or put it in the chat. See, D he he, that's a good one. And Tweedle D, ha he he, these are some good ones. <laughs> he he, yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. So now let's see what the experts would say. So they say, drink your tea. You hear that one? Another thumbs up if you hear it. Cool. All right, so now let's listen to the American Crow. And this one you might have heard before. It's a more, a more common mnemonic that we hear pretty often. But let's listen to it and see what words you'd use to the, describe the sound.
Okay, what do people think? Your ka 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 and ra ra ra, like those. You're all making me sing for you. Cra, cra, and ha, ha, ha. I like that one. <laughs> hey, awesome. A lot of you said what the experts say, which is ka. I'll listen to it quickly one more time. All right, do you all hear that one? Yeah, cool. All right, and we'll do one more. This is the tufted tip mouse, a really common one that you hear outside your window. One more time. All right. Anyone have any ideas what they'd use to describe this sound? I agree with that one. Hello, time to get up. <laughs> and here, 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 here. Awesome. So let's hear what the experts say. They say, Peter, Peter, Peter. And normally we listen to it again, but my Wi-Fi is having abnormally strained issues today. Um, All right, so this is our last question period. Um, so if you have any questions about any of the activities we did, about our science meets and what they normally look like, any questions about the Padlet or the Cooper, the Preserve, uh, now's the time to raise your hand or put them in the chat. And we will be sending up a follow-up email that has the registration for the spring Padlet and information on how to sign up for uh, virtual science meets. And uh, the, here's our contact information as well. All of our emails are listed here. Um, so you can feel free to reach out to us with any questions later on. <laughs>